At this time, we're going to participate in the Lord's table, and we're going to remember his death by partaking of the bread, which resembles his, blood, his body, and partaking of the cup, which resembles his blood. And we'll consider a passage of scripture to help us appreciate what Jesus did on the cross. And if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand, and there's some men that will hand you one. And if you don't own a Bible, this is your gift from us. We'll be looking at some verses from Psalm 71. So when you get your Bible, uh, turn to Psalm 71 in your Bible. This Psalm expresses a confidence in God. The writer recounts the faithfulness of God throughout his life and to sustain and deliver him. And he also prays that God may continue his gracious work in his life until the latter years of his life on earth. He especially extols the righteousness of God. If you have your Bible open to Psalm 71, follow along and I'm going to just read right now verses 15 and 16. These verses say, My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long. For I do not know the sum of them. I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, yours alone. Notice that verse, in verse 15, the psalmist connects the righteousness of God with God's salvation. And then look at verse 2, where he appeals to God's righteousness as the sphere in which he asks God to deliver and rescue him. And then if you skip down to verse 24, he has reason to tell of God's righteousness and salvation all day long. Look at verse 15 at the end. While he has reason to talk of these things, he realizes that there is more to God's righteousness and salvation than he even knows. He says, I, I do not know the sum of them. So what is he going to talk about? Well, look at verse 16. He will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord. The psalmist knows from his own experience of God's mighty deliverance and that this came about because of God's righteousness. So he concludes verse 16 with a statement, I will make mention of your righteousness, yours alone. As you read through Psalm 71, you will notice that the psalmist says nothing of his own achievements. Rather, he reveals his need and he recounts God's help when he called upon him. He claims no righteousness of his own, but he speaks highly of God's righteousness. Look at verse 19. For your righteousness, O God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? The Apostle Paul also ties God's righteousness to his salvation. And you don't need to turn to it, but uh, Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. In, in verse 16, he writes about the gospel being the power of God to salvation. And then in verse 17, he indicates that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And the question is, how is God's righteousness revealed in the gospel? When Jesus suffered on the cross for our sins, he was meeting the righteous penalty of God against our sin. The innocent Lamb of God was enduring the punishment that our sins deserve so that God could forgive us and yet without violating his own righteous character. Romans 3 verses 25 and 26 explains how the death of Christ demonstrates God's righteousness. It says that this, that is the public display of Christ becoming propitiation for our sins on the cross, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Under the old covenant, 
the righteousness of God was never fully revealed in animal sacrifices. This passage says that God was passing over sins previously committed. But when Jesus, the perfect God-man, died on the cross, he fully paid God's righteous demand against sins of all who would believe in him and all those who did believe in him in the Old Testament. Now it is clear that God is righteous when he justifies the sinner. Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, took our sins and God imputes his righteousness to us. For this reason, the Apostle John writes that when we confess our sin, it is righteous of God to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then two verses later, he says that he's writing to Christians that they may not sin. But if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and that's Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. That is, he fully satisfied God's wrath against our sins. God intends that, our, that his children not grovel around in sin and guilt, but that they com come to their advocate and receive mercy. In the great passage of Philippians 4, or 3, rather, in verses 9 and 10, Paul expresses his supreme goal is to know Christ and to be found in him, not having a righteousness of his own, but a righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. When we partake of communion, we proclaim the death of Jesus Christ, and we're declaring that his death alone is the basis of our salvation. We are saying that we stand before God acceptable in his righteousness alone, not in anything that we have done. If you're thinking that God will accept you based on something good you have done, you are not trusting fully in the death of Christ. And we would ask that you not partake because this, this uh, ordinance is ordained by God for those that are trusting fully in Jesus Christ for their salvation, for them to remember the death that justified them. It is, uh, so please, please give careful attention to these verses from 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is the only way that we can come to God. Men, come and serve us, and when your heart is prepared, you may partake.